you know, immense intellectual and cultural flourishing. The Islamic Golden Age. And that's exactly what we're diving into today. We've got the sources you send over and we're going to unpack them, really try to get to the heart of what made this period so revolutionary. Yeah, our mission is to pull out those key insights. And the material shows it wasn't monolithic. It was this huge interconnected civilization, multi-ethnic, multilingual. Like a crucible almost. Exactly. A crucible for science, art, medicine, philosophy. They weren't in separate boxes. They were mixing, influencing each other. Mm. And crucially, it wasn't just about conquest. It was driven by this deep curiosity, by dialogue. And it's not just ancient history, is it? The echoes are still around. You find them in tech, healthcare, things we might take for granted. Absolutely. The roots run deep. This era really starts to gain momentum uh, around the 8th century, especially with the Abbasid Caliphate. Ha, huh, Baghdad. Baghdad. Yeah. Their new capital. It quickly became more than just a political center. It turned into this, this beacon of learning, of enlightenment. So why Baghdad? What was the magic ingredient? The sources point pretty strongly towards patronage, don't they? Oh, massively. Caliphs like Harun al-Rashid and then his son al-Mamun. Mm -hmm. They weren't just rulers paying lip service. They actively poured resources into knowledge. They fostered this environment, yeah. yeah. Where it wasn't just about tolerating scholars from different backgrounds, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Zoroastrian. They encouraged them. They brought them together to collaborate. The diversity was seen as a strength. And the physical heart of this was the House of Wisdom, Beit al -Hikmah. That's it. The research describes it as this um, enormous complex, think library, translation center, research institute, all rolled into one. It was the nerve center. The descriptions are amazing. Shells packed with manuscripts from all over. Greek, Sanskrit, Syriac, Persian. But more than just storage, it was dynamic. A huge translation movement happened there. Mm -hmm. They weren't just copying. They were studying, debating, critiquing, building on that ancient wisdom. And this is where Arabic really cements itself as the language of scholarship for that whole vast region, right? A common intellectual tongue. Absolutely. So, okay, why did all this happen then and there? The sources suggest a few key things lining up. There's the religious angle that reported saying, seek knowledge, even if it takes you to China. That seems to have genuinely fostered a high value on learning. Definitely a factor. Yeah. And then there's geography. Just look at where the empire sat. Right at the crossroads. Exactly. Asia, Europe, Africa. Perfectly positioned to absorb ideas, trade goods, you know, people moving through. It's a melting pot. And you mentioned the translation movement. People like Hunan Ibn Ishaq. It wasn't just word-for-word -word translation, was it? No, not at all. They were grappling with complex philosophical and scientific ideas, finding the right ways to express them in Arabic, making them accessible. It was deep intellectual work. Assimilation, really. But maybe underneath it all, the sources seem to say it was just that basic human